Anyway, hello everybody. Well, I I was for my life. I was going to write my story down on paper and see if my story would get published. But I just decided to tell you all. This is the story about how I survived beatings and abuse by my mother and my stepfather. When I was three years old, me, me and my mom and my sister lived in Dallas somewhere in this really old burned down building. My mom that day stuck a Q-tip in my ear and dug it in there so far that my ear was bleeding and the Q-tip was stuck. Our neighbor across the hall called the police and the police didn't do much about it. They said don't do it again or they'll call social services. After that, we, well, we moved to the housing project, and I was just, had just turned four at that point, we moved to the housing project on the other side of downtown Dallas, and, and you know, from, and my mom was a bad mom. I, for me, I was stupid one day. I, I didn't think that if you turned the burner off on the stove, that the whole stove would be hot. So I was leaning up against it, and I burnt my arm from pretty much my wrist down to my elbow. And later it grew into a big old scab. Well, my mom just decided, well, I'm going to put the scab off your arm. And I was screaming, literally screaming bloody murder. And then after she pulled it off, she told me just to go. Let, let, left it open for an infection. We didn't live there but a year, and when I turned five, we moved to uh, this apartment somewhere in that close to Carrollton, which they still consider it as Dallas, the Dallas area. We moved there, and we lived there up for maybe two years. My mom was always a bad mom. My mom got mad at me at some point because I was one of the ones that didn't really want to mind when I was a child. And then my mom said, my mom told me, I ought to put bleach down your throat, but I'm not going to do that. And I asked, I said, why? She said, because, because that would kill you, but like I cared, like I cared. That's what she told me. When I was six, she started dating this guy named Glenn that she made over the internet. He seemed pretty nice. But he wasn't that nice. What long after that we moved into his house and about a month later they both got married at his church. We ended up and he got she married him at his church and not more than a month after she married him, he started beating beating me up with the bell. And every time he beat me he called him Big Mac Beat. He beat me with the belt. He would, and he didn't care where he hit me. He hit my back, my butt, even my face, and my stomach and chest. Didn't matter where he hit me, as long as I was getting my beating. He bashed my head into the wall every chance he got. He, I think, yeah, beat me, bashed my head in the wall, all kinds of stuff all for no reason. There was no reason for him to do it. There were things that happened. They were just complete and utter accidents. They were just complete accidents. And he just beat me up. Bashed my head in the wall anyway. And he said, when it, when he was beating me, he said if my hand got in the way, it didn't count. And then he'd do it again. And he beat me at least 50 times. And by the time he got through, I, I at least had 150 licks across my back 
back and butt, not have marks everywhere. He did it for three years of my life. He beat me. And, you know, I've been trying to recover from that. It's been eight years since it happened. And I remember all this like it was yesterday. I could go to sleep right now and dream of it. He's, he beat me and he beat me. And like one day, my mom walked my mom's bottle of facial cream, her day cream for her face, was missing. Her bottle was missing. I told her I threw it away because it was empty, and I did. She got mad at me. Threw it, she got mad at me and so mad at me. Every time I told her I threw it away, she said that wasn't so. And it was because, well, she couldn't prove it because garbage management had come and took it. And her husband got so pissed off at me that he decided he was going to slap my leg. He left a big nasty hamper like right in front of my leg here. He did it. And he got so mad and did that. And the next day, it was like a Friday, my sister went to the principal at school because we had a new principal. Now, we just got a new principal in. And she, my sister went up there and talked to her and told her what, what was happening and going on. So, she, so later the principal called me in the office. Couldn't understand why she was in the office. But I noticed my sister was walking back to class. I asked her, why, I asked her. I said, why does principal want me? And she said, I told the principal what happened, what's been going on at home. My sister got the nerve to stand up for me and did it. She stood up for me and told the principal what was going on. And we went home, you know, and when I got to the principal and see the handprint, I pulled my pants down to show them. said she was calling social services. I sh and she did. When I got home that afternoon, my dad was waiting, waiting to pick me and my sister up to come to his house for a visit. Because we come, supposed to come every other weekend for visits at that point. We got here and my grandma didn't notice it, but the next morning I was wearing shorts and she said, she said, what the hell happened to your bike? And I couldn't tell her. I was too scared to. Because Glenn threatened to beat I'm threatened to, uh, to break every bone in my body. He threatened me. He always threatened me. I was so scared of him. I was always huddled in the corner cowering because he was afraid of what he was going to do next because you never knew. He surprised you. You could be up in your room playing Barbie or something and then he just walk up and beat you out of the book. You never knew what, when he was going to do it. He scared me. I'm so scared, but I eventually opened up to my grandma and told her. What I told her what, what went on. We went through. After we went through that, it was yeah, we went to police and all that. We went through that. We went through social services, and and for a whole year I went from uh, a group home, an anger management hospital, and a foster home, and then I got to live with my grandma. Cause yeah, I lived with my grandma. She got me lots of presents for Christmas because all I got for Christmas for three years at my at Glenn's house was a nightgown. I got a nightgown for Christmas for three years when we were there. And when I got here to my grandma's, I got I got all kinds of presents. And I told her, I looked at them. And I said, Mimo, I'm like, you know what I really got for Christmas? She said, you know what? I'm like, I, I got love for Christmas. I'm like, what more can an abused, a beaten and abused child ask for? It's just, I'm oh, like, nothing. I couldn't ask for anything more. You gave me love, and that's all I ever wanted. 
was, was a family who loved me. And ever since then, I've been pretty much trying to stay strong for myself and everyone around me. My grandma loved me and she has not once laid a hand on me. Not even my dad. I love them both and my aunt too and my aunt been dead for four years and she was like a mother to me. Since I was here she was like a mother to me. My grandma is too. I love I love my whole I love everybody in my house. My grandma, my daddy, my sister, even my half brother. He is my half brother, but I treat him like he's my full brother, no flesh and blood, because I love him. And I am so happy to this day to be, I'm lucky to even be alive. Because, yeah, because there's one day, back then my mom found me, passed out my room. Her husband let me go three days without food and water and told me to eat my own feces out of a bucket he told me to use as a bathroom. Yeah. I was always so scared. I was always so scared of, of what of Glenn and what he was going to do next. That if I hadn't, if I hadn't told my grandma what went on, I would have never got came here. I would have had to stay with my mom. And I am lucky that I am alive today. And you know, and one of my dreams, I have, I've, I've had this dream for the last five years. My number one dream is to meet Justin. You know who I'm talking about. My number one dream is to meet Justin himself. And to, yeah, yeah. I would, yeah, the number one dream is to meet him. I am surprising me here at home. I've always wanted to be able to sing one song with him on stage in front of a big, big audience. And if that would just, if that happened to me, that would be the greatest day of my life. And nothing can ever top that. Because he's my idol, my inspiration. He, for me, is the reason why I keep going. He shows me that there is hope in the world. There is hope for everyone out there. And that, yeah. and I love being here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my story. And I hope you take it to heart. Because that's exactly what I've done. I took it to heart. But that dream is what I want to come true. I want him to surprise me at home. I want to sing one of his songs with him on stage. <laughs> with him. At a concert. Or even on the Ellen Show. I would love to do that. And you know what? If it, if it hadn't, if he hadn't become famous and I hadn't got, gotten into his music, I probably wouldn't be here. Because the fact is, I love everything that I do. 
keep myself going strong. And He is the one reason why I do. There's hope, hope in the world. There's all kinds of things in this world that most people don't even realize. And I never give up. I fight it. I fight it. In that moment when I was a kid, I fought for my life. And I kept on, and I kept on fighting because, you know what? Never say never. That was, that, that was what he said. Because he at one point said it was corny. But it's not. He is right. We shouldn't give up on our dreams. Follow your dreams and never say never. And I will continue to follow my dreams. And I won't ever give up. I will fight. I will fight. Peace.